In this video, we're going to take a look at arrhythmia, or it's going to be another video in our sequence of videos on arrhythmia. And in this case, we're specifically looking at altered, altered automaticity. So in terms of automaticity, we're really talking about the pacemaker cells of the heart and their ability to generate auto, uh, basically automatic impulses. And when that gets impaired, whether the impulse is being generated too slow or too fast, we can start to see arrhythmia occur. So to give us a brief overview, again, we want to look at the conduction system of the heart. So we have our SA node, we have our AV node, we have our bundle of his or his bundle. And then from our his bundle, we have the bundle branches. So an impulse goes from the SA node to the AV node, AV node to the bundle of his, bundle of his to our bundle branches, and then our bundle branches to our Purkinje fibers. And what's specific about these kind of uh, landmarks of the conduction system is that they're densely packed with pacemaker cells. So if we kind of blow up our SA node here and we take a look at what the SA node actually looks like in terms of cell structure, is if we look at these blue cells as our pacemaker cells and these red cells as our uh, myocytes or our muscle cells, you can see that in these, this nodal tissue, we have these densely packed pacemaker cells. So again, the blue cells are pacemaker cells. And having the pacemaker cells densely packed amongst our myocytes or our muscle cells is what allows us to drive contraction. So we have the, you know, we have uh, gap junctions between all these cells. It's allowing them to fire into incision. But having this densely packed uh, area of pacemaker cells covers a lot of surface area and it's going to send out a lot of impulses, or it's going to generate a lot of impulses. So once the pacemaker cells fire, we start to see impulses being generated out to all of these cardiac myocytes, which we know have hundreds of connections to other cardiac myocytes due to the gap junctions that are allowing them to uh, fire and syncytium. So this is how we kind of get this wave-like response after this pacemaker fires. Now, in order to understand automaticity, we need to understand how these cells actually work. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually focus in on one of these pacemaker cells. So we're going to take a look at um, this guy right here, and we're going to um, try to kind of break down what is actually happening in a, a pacemaker cell, or how is a pacemaker cell actually generating its impulse. And if we understand that, we can kind of start to understand what's going to happen when automaticity is altered or how automaticity can become altered. So our normal impulse looks something like this. It starts just below negative 40. We're going to uh, slowly kind of move up towards threshold. We hit a threshold and you start to see our impulse generated. And because this is a pacemaker cell, it basically happens automatically like this again and again and again until we die. We'll label the stages on this because it'll make a difference for us later. So this bottom stage here is stage four. And we're looking at stage zero, uh, stage three, and then obviously stage four again. And stage four is what we're going to be concerned about when we're talking about automaticity, or one of the things we're going to be concerned about when we talk about automaticity. The other thing to point out here is the negative 40, which is our threshold potential. Or basically, it's going to be uh, the potential where we have lots of opening of calcium channels that's going to lead to the actual action potential. So what happens in the first stage, or what we're looking at in this stage four, or what we're looking at um, as this impulse is slowly creeping up, is sodium, or sodium's uh, uh, what's driving this. So the stage four is driven by IF funny channels, or they're basically a sodium channel or a leaky sodium channel. Um, as we get to this kind of more negative threshold or we uh, hit to levels around negative 60, we start to see this uh, kind of increased influx of sodium into the cell, which is allowing for uh, this increase in automaticity. So we have a leaky sodium channel or a sodium channel that remains open within the heart. So we, what happens is when our heart decides to start beating is we hit this low threshold, so, uh, you know, around negative 60, and sodium wants to balance the electrical chemical gradient, so sodium starts to move into our pacemaker cell. So sodium starts to build up inside this uh, pacemaker cell, and we know that as sodium builds up, or sodium is a positively charged ion, we start to see an increase in our resting membrane potential, or it becomes more positive. The influx of these positive ions then open a calcium channel 
um, that's going to lead to calcium influx. So this is going to be a transient calcium channel. So this blue one that we're looking at here is a transient calcium channel. And the function of our transient uh, calcium channel, the opening of the uh, transient calcium channel is what really allows us to push this resting membrane potential closer to threshold. So we see an initial influx of calcium into the cell. So this is our calcium. So an initial influx of calcium, which is going to help, again, increase our resting memory potential. And if we look at where that's happening, it's happening right here. So this kind of just before we reach threshold is where we have the uh, transient influx of calcium or our transient calcium cells open, and they push us towards threshold. The combination of these two things, so the influx of sodium and the influx of calcium, are what allow us to reach this negative 40, or we reach a threshold potential where all of our uh, calcium channels or all of our long-lasting calcium channels are going to open. And what happens is we see this huge influx of calcium. So as we reach threshold, we have tons of opening of our long-lasting calcium channels, and we have a major influx of calcium into the cell. So uh, this part of our action potential here, or the, the actual part where we start reaching an action potential, this is caused by our uh, long-lasting calcium channels. So we have the influx of calcium that's allowing us to actually have an action potential. Now, as the action potential uh, starts to fade out or we hit our kind of uh, max potential, we have voltage-gated potassium channels that are going to open that are going to allow potassium to enter our cell. So then we have potassium, or sorry, it's going to allow potassium to exit our cell. Um, so we have potassium exiting the cell. We have potassium efflux, which is going to make it more positive outside, decrease positivity inside, and we're actually going to see some closing of our calcium channels, which is going to uh, give us this final stage. So what you see in this stage three is uh, potassium channel opening, we have potassium efflux, and we actually close our calcium channels. So that's how we have automaticity. And really, if you look at what this all uh, hinges on or what it's going to rely on, is it relies on our IF funny channels that are going to allow for um, the influx of, uh, of sodium, which is going to lead to an increasing membrane potential, or at least that's kind of slope of that stage four. It relies on the presence of transient and long-lasting calcium channels, which is going to trigger an action potential, or is what's going to actually allow us to meet threshold. Um, and then finally, um, we need to have it kind of all reset again. Now, what the importance of this is, is once this action potential occurs, or once we have um, the myocardial cell performance function and action potential occurs, that is what's going to trigger the myocyte to, uh, it's what's going to actually trigger the myocyte to perform it, its function. So we see that our myocyte, kind of the action potential for it looks something like this. And what's important to note is what we're looking at or what we just kind of went over with that, uh, with the, the pacemaker cell functioning is occurring right here. The pacemaker is what acts as the stimulus for our myocyte action potential. So just like I need to, to generate a pain response, for example, or generate a, a, a action potential for my brain, I need some sort of stimulus that's going to lead to sodium channel opening and action potential. I need the same thing in my myocyte. And the stimulus is the pacemaker cell. So we have the pacemaker cell fires, acts as the stimulus for the myocyte, and leads to a full action potential. So that being said, three things can change automaticity. So we know that we need a number of things in order for our pacemaker cells to function automatically. And if we alter those things, we can alter automaticity. So the first thing we're going to talk about is our maximum diastolic potential. Um, or really, we're going to look at what the resting potential of our pacemaker cells is during diastole. So first thing is resting diastolic potential. And what the resting diastolic potential is, is how basically negative our uh, pacemaker potential is going to get. So again, if you look at it, we're sitting around somewhere around negative 60 
in our typical uh, pacemaker potential. Now, what happens is if we make that resting di uh, diastolic potential much lower, or say we put it around negative 80 or negative 100, we need to get much further before we can stimulate this impulse. So the impulse may occur at the same rate, repolarization may occur at the same rate, but because it's occurring at a much, it's much slower because it's taking us much longer to make it up to that threshold. And again, threshold hasn't changed. Just our way of getting to it has, or, or how far we have to go to get to it has, this can lead to a change in automaticity. Um, that being said, a more rapid change, or if I uh, push that um, memory potential much closer to threshold, or my resting diastolic potential is much more positive, that can also lead to a change. So again, if we draw it kind of up here around um, maybe negative uh, 50, there's not far for it to go before we actually uh, can have an action potential, so that can speed up rate. So you can see how changing the resting diastolic potential or changing the endpoint of where we're starting from um, can lead to either a, an increased speed or decreased speed through which our pacemaker cells will fire, ultimately changing the speed at which our heart will beat. The second thing that we should talk about is our threshold potential. So we know that our threshold potential is governed by our calcium channels, so the number of calcium channels that we have, um, the amount of calcium that's going to um, cause influx during, during that transient period um, in order to open those long-lasting channels. So if, say we have less transient calcium channels or those transient calcium channels are blocked, that's actually going to change our threshold. Um, it's going to make it much higher and we're going to have to uh, reach a higher threshold. Uh, potential before we can have our action potential. So uh, threshold potential does the same thing. So just like we talked about moving our end diastolic potential, I could move my threshold potential up, which means that now my impulse has to travel much further before I can have an action potential, which is going to slow my rate down. Or I can move my threshold potential uh, down, or I can make it much closer to where my resting memory potential is. And as a result, that's going to speed my rate up, or it's going to make uh, it the, have to travel much less distance in order to have an action potential. So if I increase threshold potential, I'm going to um, slow my rate. If I decrease my threshold potential, I'm going to speed up my rate. Now, the last thing is the rate and slope of phase four, or when we're talking about phase four, we're specifically talking about our sodium ions. So what we can do is, say we start blocking our sodium channels. Um, as a result, sodium is going in, to flow into the cell much slower, and that's going to slow our impulse. So we might be starting from the same area, but we've increased the or decreased the rate and slope of stage four. So now it's taking us a really long time uh, for uh, sodium to have its influx into the cell. So again, everything else might be unchanged, but I have this really slow rate and uh, slope of stage four. Now the alternative can, can obviously be true as well. So we might be starting from the same spot, but I have this much faster rate and slope, which is going to speed up my heart rate. So we can see how subtle changes to the pacemakers can, or the pacemaker automaticity can very much change uh, or cause an arrhythmia. So the third thing is the rate and slope of phase four of the pacemaker potential. So again, if I increase my uh, resting diastolic potential, we'll call it our RDP. So if I increase RDP, we know that I'm going to make it closer to threshold. I'm going to lead to an increase rate. The alternative is true. If I decrease my resting diastolic potential, I'm going to lead to decreased rate. And you can see that here. The further down it goes, the much longer it takes to get to threshold and cause an impulse. In terms of threshold potential, if I increase threshold pot uh, potentials, we'll call it TP, if I increase threshold potential, what's going to happen is I'm going to decrease rates. So these ones are in, uh, inversely proportional. So the higher my threshold potential, so again, if we're looking at it here, my threshold potential is very high. It's going to take much longer 
for this impulse to reach the threshold. So I increase threshold potential, I'm going to lead to a decrease in rate. If I decrease threshold potential, I make it closer to my resting member potential, I'm going to increase rate. And you can see that as we look at this impulse. So it's much closer, which is going to lead to a decrease in rate or, or an increase in rate, or it takes less time to make it to the threshold. And then finally, I can increase or decrease the rate and slope of stage four. So if I lead to, if I cause an increase in rate um, and an increase in slope, what you can see is we have this increased rate and slope, which is leading to a faster impulse. So increased rate and slope can lead to an increase in heart rate. And obviously the alternative is true as well. If I decrease the rate and slope of this phase uh, of phase four, I'm going to decrease my heart rate. I'm going to slow my heart rate down. And you can see that here.